In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel, and we, we've been studying in this book a little bit, but I know that I'm going out of order here, but I, I love the story that 1 Samuel opens with, and one of the great heroines of the Bible, arguably my favorite heroine in the Bible, Hannah, it gives her story and talks about her faith. And it, it's just, I know that I'd already given some, some material that was after this story, but I, I had to go back and discuss this since we started this series on 1 Samuel. So to understand what is going on in this scene, Elkanah, and I believe that's how to pronounce his name, I'm not a Jewish scholar, and his two wives, one of which is named Hannah, used to go to sacrifice every year at this particular temple, and this was a annual tradition. They did it every year, and Hannah is barren, and the other wife is not. And as you can imagine, that causes a great deal of tension between her to the point that she actually uses the word and, and refers to the other wife as her adversary, which I think is hilarious because if you, I don't know if it's the same Hebrew word used here, but that's the same word that the Bible uses, at least in English, to describe the devil. So I don't know if that's actually what she was calling him, uh, but it seems as though it's the same word, at least based on my, my English translation. So I do find that quite amusing that she refers to her as, as the adversary and that that may actually be her referring to her the, the same as the devil himself, uh, which I would have found hysterical reading that. But beyond that, I do think that one thing that we have to take note of here, and I, I get people that are skeptics of the Bible talk about this all the time, that the Bible is a endorsed polygamy. And I'm just sitting there like, have you not read the Bible? Because yes, there are Bible heroes that engaged in polygamy. Can you point to one where it actually worked out well for him? Where the Bible has actually something nice to say about polygamy? Because uh, I don't. And other characters in this same book of 1 Samuel are a glaring example of that. But here's another example of somebody that it doesn't give a whole lot of information on, but we hear about him having two wives, and the only thing that we know about that relationship and the health of that relationship is that one of the wives is so angry at the other one that she refers to her as the adversary. And that's just a relationship that never works, it never can the Bible doesn't endorse polygamy. In fact, it doesn't seem to ever have anything nice to say about it. It only cast it, so far as I'm aware, in a very negative light. It either stays silent on it or has some pretty awful commentary on it. It doesn't really speak very highly of that kind of relationship at all. And so what's fascinating about this is when these two wives are going at it, Hannah, of course, being barren, they go to the sacrifice every year, and Hannah has been. You know, Hannah goes to this particular sacrifice this year that we have recorded in the book of 1 Samuel, and this is how she reacts to going down. If you'll look at uh, 1 Samuel 1 9 through 11, where it reads Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on my affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. And of course, with hindsight, we understand that the child that was born there, her prayers were answered, and, and she did have a son, and she did dedicate him to the Lord, and, and kept everything in the vow that she made in that prayer, 
and the boy's name was Samuel. But let's look without thinking too much about the result and, and looking at it with too much hindsight. Let's look at the content of that prayer. Where does that prayer strike you? What are some of the observations that you make about it? Because based on the context of the story, based on the way that the Bible is explicit in explaining that this was an annual thing that this family did, that they made this annual pilgrimage to this temple, and hearing this prayer by Hannah, you think this is attempt number one? Because I tend to not. And I don't think that I'm making any kind of big biblical example or logical leap here. I think it's pretty darn obvious that what is going on here is that this woman, Hannah, has been praying for a child for a very, very long time. Now, we don't know. We don't know how old Hannah is. We don't know how old her husband is. We don't know how long they've been married. We don't know how long she's been dreaming of it. A lot of women then, just like a lot of women now, dream about being a mom their entire lives. But even if we're just taking the timetable out of it, it's safe to assume that this is not something that's only been going on a couple years. This has probably been going on for a really, really long time. How long, we're not sure. But that's every indication coming not only from the way that the Scripture reads in describing the story, the lead-up to it, but also the way she talks about in this prayer that, God, if, if you remember me and if you give me this child, then I will make a vow that he will be a Nazarene. You know, maybe a woman on her first attempt at praying to God for a child would do something like that, but it doesn't seem likely. It seems to me what's going on here, and, and I don't think that the danger in a prayer like this, I think, is that you start thinking about God as a, a giant space gumball machine, that you just do exactly the right thing and make a bargain with Him and say, God, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. I don't think that that's the message that the prayer is giving. I think the reason that that is included in here is because it shows Hannah's desperation. I think God had intended to grant her a son at some point regardless but this request, I don't think, is what convinced God to go ahead and give her a child because he wanted to have the child. From, I don't think that's the message that it's giving at all. The message that I do think that it is trying to convey is this is a person that has been praying desperately for years on end for this blessing and hasn't had it answered. And I think that's something that is just so relatable. That despite you know, being really similar to Hannah in no way whatsoever, except the fact that I too have had certain things that I've prayed for that just God never seems to answer me on or, or never seems to answer in the way that I want him to. I think that that's a way that we, see, we can see Hannah even today as somebody that's very relatable. And I think that everybody has had something similar to that happen to them that you just keep praying and keep praying and pre keep praying and don't understand why it's not working. And so because of that, I want to try to deconstruct this and get inside Hannah's head a little bit. What did Hannah tell herself when her prayers weren't answered? And again, since this is such a human, relatable story, I think the smartest way to do that is to ask ourselves, if we were in this position... How would we react? What would our reaction have been to something like this? Because just being perfectly honest, I know what mine would have been. There's about six or seven different options that I can think of that would have been pretty similar to, to what I would have said. But one thing that I can think of is, you know, in, in Hannah's position, maybe God just doesn't want me to have a baby. Now, of course, I'm going back to Hannah specifically because, you know, I'm a guy and regardless of what every liberal in California might tell you, I, I can't do that. But uh, uh, in Hannah's case, she's there thinking, maybe this just isn't something that God wants for me. Maybe this is something that's going to, to always go unanswered. Maybe this is just not who I am, and, and this isn't what God wants for me. And you know what? Maybe she would have been right. I'm sure there were women not only throughout biblical times, but now, that pray for a child 
and don't understand why that never comes to pass. And maybe God's plan for those women is not for them to have children. Maybe he wants them to serve him in a different way. I, I don't know. But that's not an unfair way to think about it. Maybe Hannah is thinking, maybe I'm being punished for something that I did. Maybe I made a mistake, and and because I have sinned, and, and because that's something that you know I, I have to work out spiritually, that that I just I can't do that. And I know that that's something that I've thought about with certain sins that, that I'm not, that I'm being punished for something that there are real world ramifications, not necessarily something that God sent down upon me or whatever, but that I, this blessing has been withheld from me because I'm having a hard time getting this sin out of my life. Maybe she thought that God knows I'm just not ready to be a mom. Maybe God is holding out on me because this is going to be answered later and I'm just upset that it hasn't shown up yet, and I'm getting impatient. Maybe that was Hannah's mentality. I don't know. I just know that that's something that I've thought about before, regardless of what it was that I was praying for, that, you know, may, maybe God doesn't want this for me right now, or, or maybe I'm being held back because there's something else I have to do first, and I don't know what that is. And then, I think one that is incredibly common amongst people when the prayer isn't answered. Maybe God's not there. Maybe God isn't answering me because God isn't there. Whether it's he's not there in the sense that he's just not listening to me, or he's not there in the sense that God isn't real. Maybe my prayers haven't been answered because God isn't there to answer them. Now, up until now, every suggestion that I've given to you is not one that would necessarily be incorrect in certain circumstances. This one, of course, would be. But I think it illustrates how we can sort of have a crisis of faith and that our faith can be shaken because we have the wrong idea about God. Because I think there's a lot of people that would default to that last one that I read first that they wouldn't think, maybe God has a good reason for this, or maybe there's something that I'm just not getting right now. Maybe God is, is holding back because he knows that I'm not ready yet for, for this blessing or whatever it is that I'm asking for him to do. But regardless of that, regardless of that, that last question is fundamentally different. Because what that does is it puts the responsibility back on, on God and says that God is the problem, not me. That's where I really think the error is. And, and with the other suggestions of, you know, maybe I'm not ready yet, maybe uh, there's some kind of sin that I need to get out of my life before that this can take place, maybe it's something that I don't realize that I'm doing to myself. Regardless of what it is, regardless of the reason that that blessing is being held back and the reason that God is saying no, ultimately where faith comes in is that we have faith that God knows better than us. That if God's answer for something is no, he must have a good reason. If God's answer is something that we don't like, there's got to be a good reason out there. You know, it's hard not to connect this in some ways with everything that's going on in the country right now that maybe the reason that we've asked for pardon or asked for this plague to pass over us without really doing any harm either to us physically or our families or this country or our economy or whatever it may be, and God says no, maybe there's a good reason for that. And I think a good analogy here would be to, to understand, as the Bible illustrates so many times, God is a father. You know, when you're a little kid, four or five, in your mind, there's never a good reason to get a shot. Never. There is nothing that an adult could do for the average four or five-year-old. Maybe there are some exceptions that I'm just unaware of. But for the average kid, you're not going to be able to convince them through a series of logical arguments why it is essential that they get a shot. You're just not going to be able to do that. 
So why do kids do it? Well, granted, there are probably some kids that they basically just have to hold them down and give them the shot. But the reason that I think probably on average most kids don't, that they, even though they, they may cry, they may squirm, they may wince, they're willing to do so when they get around that age is not because they understand. It's because their parents do. It's because when their mom or dad tells them that it is in their best interest to do that, they take it on faith that the parent is smarter than them. And usually that's because they have learned through experience that that is a good policy to have. Like when mom and dad say, don't stick the key in the light socket, we usually learn through experience why they're telling us not to do that. When they say, don't put your hand on that, it's hot, and then we do it and it burns, normally that is a teaching moment to where the kid learns, yeah, maybe mom and dad know what they're talking about after all and I should listen to them. And that's why when a kid gets to a certain age, you know, six, seven, eight, something like that, they still don't like it. And in their mind, there's still not a reason good enough to justify them getting a shot. They take it on faith that their parents' wisdom is superior to their own. They know that their parents love them. They know that their parents want what's best for them. They know that their parents have always done everything to protect them. So if they're asking me to do this thing that I really hate, that hurts so much, they've got to have a good reason. So even though I don't like it, I'll go through with it. See, that's the reason that I think Jesus tells us to come to him as a little child. That we have faith that whatever the reason, whatever the answer is, whatever it is that we pray for, if God comes back and says, no, the way to have that kind of faith that Jesus asks us to have is to remember that God's our Father and his wisdom is just better than ours. That if you're asking him for a child, or a mate, or a better job, or this or that, or, or whatever else it may be, and God's answer comes back, and it's a big fat no, that God's not tell it, giving you that no because he doesn't like you or doesn't care about you. God is coming back with that no because he can see things that you can't, he understands things that you don't understand, and if he comes back with a no, there's a darn good reason for it. In the same way that if a little kid asks, Mom, can I just not get this shot? And the mom responds, no. They don't like that answer. They know that that answer is going to cause them pain, but ultimately they believe that that answer really must be in their best interest because my mom who loves me would not ask me to do this if she didn't have a really, really good reason. That's the kind of childlike faith we should strive for. But there's one last observation I want to make before we close out. When it comes to Hannah, did the prayers ever stop? We're given no indication that they are, because like I said, it seems to me this is a person that has been praying for a really, really long time for this to take place, and they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming. Hannah keeps getting a no, she keeps praying. This seems like a prayer that she's probably prayed a thousand times. Maybe not in this exact way, but I'm just saying in general, a prayer to have a child. I imagine a person that is faithful as Hannah, a person that has done this every year. This is a prayer that she's done so many times, she's probably sick of it. And I think that the lesson for us in that is, just because God is saying no right now doesn't mean he won't say yes later. Maybe he's waiting for the opportune time for something in his divine plan. Maybe he's waiting for the opportune time because it's what benefits us. Maybe he's waiting for the opportune time because it benefits somebody else. Or maybe he's saying no because there is no opportune time. And whether we understand it or not, there's a reason that there is a no coming down the pike. And it will always be that way. That happens sometimes. I get that. I've been in that situation. But remember that he said no to Hannah an awful lot, and there are probably some women that asked this their entire lives and never got the answer, but God still took care of him, and he still knew what was best for them. And ultimately, 
him saying no didn't inhibit his relationship with some of them either. When it comes down to it, we don't know the reason that God gave Hannah a no. We've speculated. We've talked about some of the options. We've talked about some of the things that we would do if we were in Hannah's position. But ultimately, we don't know because we're not given an answer. And neither was Hannah. Yet despite the fact that Hannah never figured out why God was doing this, the Scripture never tells us, and yet, she doesn't seem real concerned with all that once her blessing is actually awarded. Like, she doesn't come back and like, you know, God, I'm, I'm super glad that you finally gave me this child, but why? W what was the hang-up? You see, as Christians, we understand that there is an eternal reward coming as long as we obey the Scripture and, and do what God asks of us. And when that comes, yeah, there's going to be an awful lot of no's, and, and maybe we do even ask. Maybe we even are curious about that. I don't know, but frankly, I think by the time we get there, we're just not going to care anymore. Just like Hannah with Samuel, once that baby's there, she doesn't really care what the answer was. She's just glad that that blessing came her way. I think that's the kind of faith that we can emulate. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.